that we are to worship you. And I pray that no flesh will try and glory in your presence. I pray that there's no posture in this room that displeases you, but that we're all in a vulnerable place that you might be pleased to dwell with us and move by your power. Let every chain be broken in this room. I pray every yoke would be destroyed now uh, and the captive will go free today. Every blinded eye will be open today. Every heart that's broken will be mended today and we will be touched by your truth and made better in Jesus' name. If you're in agreement, shout amen. amen. Um, let's repeat these words. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou has created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. When I shout glory, you shout hallelujah. Glory! Now put them hands together and praise God one more time as you take your seat. Hallelujah. Thank you, choir and music team, and to all of you who make up the Lord's worship and to the rendition in, in Spanish today. You heard all of that, Sister Jennifer. Some of you didn't know what, what, the, what that language was. You slow, but you were waiting on we. You'll catch up and... Brother Enos came out, Angel Enos singing angelic. My brother, praise God for the Enos family and to all of you who are make up the Lord's worship. If you have a Bible, you to turn with me to Joshua chapter 24. I'm going to do a quick recap. And the subject today is organizing my family to flourish. Organizing my family life to flourish. This is part two. So let's pick it up today and see what God is saying concerning his people. Joshua is the character God gives us. And you know, the Bible says in Romans that the Old Testament is actually written for our what? Learning. And so God gives us individuals that we are to take examination of concerning their life. Whenever God decides to use a person, you can always discover, if you look intently at it, a pattern or a precedent about God why God does what he does. Throughout the Old Testament, when God chose an individual, when it came to Abraham, God answers the question, why did I choose Abraham or Abram when he was an idolater? His daddy was one. You know why God said he chose Abraham and made a covenant with him? He says, because I knew he would raise his children right. Hello, somebody. One of the other reasons why God comes to Joshua after Moses is dead, and we find it, Throughout Joshua's life. Joshua 24 somewhat sum. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites. Look at all these gods and what they have to offer you. You got to make a choice. Whose side you going to be on in the land and who and in, in, in which you dwell. You can choose that God. But then he says, but as for me and my house. Hallelujah. We will serve the Lord. And in verse 31 of Joshua 24, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Not only did Joshua serve God, all the elders that came behind him served God. Joshua was some kind of organizer. 
and he organized his family to flourish. Four biblical states as it relates to family. I'll quickly recap. The unmarried state, that's for every single person in the room or a person that was previously married. That's the unmarried state. That's a state of family life. The espoused state. This is those of you who are, what, considering marriage. Okay? Preparation. You're in preparation. And oh, by the way, if you're considering marriage, you should be practicing abstinence. Look at somebody and tell them, now, he already in your business, already. <laughs> yeah, that's what we call the espoused state. Thirdly, the marriage state. Three stages of the marriage state. You're in agreement. And not on purpose. And then wonder why it don't last. Because passion, hello somebody, can run out. Fulfillment is not in passion. It's in purpose. You got it? And so for every purpose, there's an indispersable plan. Inseparable plan. Ignorance of potential causes us to retreat from revealed purpose. And when you don't understand purpose, abuse is inevitable. When you don't understand your purpose, you will abuse you. You will sample with life. When you get connected with somebody that don't understand their purpose, they will not only abuse you, but will abuse themselves. When I don't know the purpose of a thing, abuse is inevitable. Give this iPad to a baby and see don't they abuse it. 
Why? Because they don't know the purpose of it. Hello, somebody. Yeah. You can live according to purpose, watch this, or you can exist according to your predicament. You can live according to purpose or exist according to your predicament. Now, right now, your predicament might be okay, and you say, I'll take that. But as the world turns, everybody's predicament, it changes. And without purpose, you become victimized by your predicament. And God has given every person that will walk in purpose permission to overcome. Lord have mercy. It's only when I'm in purpose I have permission to overcome any predicament. So when I'm in purpose, I'm never talking about, well, under the circumstances, I'm doing okay. Because I'm never under the circumstances when I'm walking in purpose. Are you hearing me today? So you're never going to get me to describe myself by my predicament. Because I'm not defined that way. There were five requirements we learned from Joshua's life on how to maximize relationships. And I'm quickly recapping. Number one, learn from your predecessors. Learn from your predecessors. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Learn. Tell somebody, get back to learning. God always puts somebody in your life that has gone on before you. Whether it's up close or at a distance, you and I need to learn from our predecessors. Joshua learned from Moses. Number two, depend on the supernatural for help. If you're going to maximize relationships, you got to depend on God doing something for you that you can't do for yourself. Don't ever think you're going to have healthy relationships when you get yourself all together, when you become perfect and then you're ready. That's not the case. Hello, somebody. No, you can have peace with God even in your imperfections. That's a whole nother sermon. Yeah, depend on the supernatural help from God. In other words, live in the vulnerable place with God. Live broken, live humble, live always in expectation. Like a child lives with a parent dependent upon the parent, God says, live that way with me. Get up every morning and don't trust your flesh. Trust me. Get up every morning and say, God, let's go. You take the lead. I'll follow. You got it? Number three, he brought cleansing from sin to the camp. Always be willing to identify sin wherever it's at and address it. Am I talking good in here? Number four, he had no tolerance for mediocrity and laziness. If you're going to maximize relationships, you cannot tolerate mediocrity and laziness. Are you with me? Now, sometimes lazy people have a great way of talking with passion. Are you hearing me right now? They be always talking about what they're going to do. And if I get the right opportunity. And usually most of their statements talk like this when you start off asking them something. You have a car? Well, right now. I'm riding my mama car. You got a job? Well, right now. I'm a tween job. But see, I'm going to be a movie producer. See, I'm, I'm getting ready to blow up. Well, well, you got relationship? Well, right now, my cousin working. You always got to watch out for right now. Number five, he challenged others to make right choices. You want to maximize relationships? Let people know, I expect to be challenged to make right choices, but I also must challenge. If we're going to maximize it, and parents and children have to understand this. As children come out of adolescence, you got to understand, parents are not in your life to be your friend or to make you feel good. We're in your life to challenge you to make what kind of choices? Right choices. Choices that align with your purpose, not just what is for pleasure. Hello, somebody. You don't want me to have fun. You don't want me to. And listen, success never goes on sale. It's going to cost you. Watch this. And so the first priority of life is what we, what we must become, not what we must do. And when you take time to be, you will have what it takes to do. So this is what God tells Joshua. I want you to meditate. Don't let the word depart out of your mouth. Meditate day and night. Observe. Take observation to do. 
Because when you work on what you be, meditation, it helps you become what God wants you to become. Then you will have what it takes to do. Are you with me today? Yes. So who am I on the inside? Success in any relationship state is primarily dependent upon your emotional state than any other factor. Success in relationships is dependent primarily upon what state? Your emotional state than any other factor. When I am an emotional wreck or I recognize I've got emotional deficits in my life, all of my relationships are in trouble. And emotional deficits can occur, brothers and sisters, at an early stage in life. From our gender instincts, training, our hurt, our experiences, social conditioning, deficits. You've heard the statement, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. No, the wrong words can kill you. The wrong words can create holes in you. The wrong words creates deficits. The wrong words can extract from you. Just like words can add to you, the wrong words can take from you. Are you hearing me today? Yeah. Say you're confident, right? You're confident in your ability. I remember playing basketball for the first time with Deacon Poole. And he acted like he could play ball. And we got out there, and anybody know me on the basketball court, I don't bite my tongue. I just call it like I see it. I'm just, mercy. <laughs> and I had to catch myself because I talked so bad about his shot until he quit playing basketball. <laughs> Tell somebody, you owe somebody an apology. I apologize, Deacon. <laughs> words hurt. This is why the Bible says, by our words, we're justified. By our words, we're condemned. We have a human weakness, all of us. We're, we, we're born shaping in iniquity because of original sin. Let me go quickly. Stay with me. Man's inability to face stress of strained relationships started right after the fall. Say it again. Man's inability to face the strain of relationships began with Adam and Eve. Are you hearing me today? And those stressful strains are still producing relationship troubles today. And when those relationships are strained, we develop proclivities. We start to look for fulfillment substitutes. When our relationships are strained, check it out, and I'm going to go right here to our human condition. We develop the hiding syndrome. We shut down. We're not present any longer. When those relationships are strained, we develop sexual addictions. When those relationships are strained, we develop the wrong relationship with money. It becomes an idol. It becomes a fulfillment substitute. We are buying stuff we don't need. Hello, somebody. Shopping addictions. We become obsessed with it. We begin to define our self-worth by how much money we have. What's doing that? Maybe somebody in a previous relationship made you feel bad because you didn't have enough money. Or you wasn't on that status. You ever walked in a store, let's say it's an upscale Saks or Neiman Marcus, and they look at you up and down as soon as you walk in like, they don't even speak. Now you know you broke, but you're trying to figure out how they know. How they know I'm just in here window shopping. They don't know I'm using my rent money to buy this purse. Look at somebody tell that man need to leave you alone. What is going on in here? 
Remember how that made you feel? It produced the deficit. Sometimes looks can rob us when we're not guarded, when we don't know who we are, when we're not walking in purpose, when we're, when we're fulfilled by something else besides purpose. We develop excessive habits regarding controlled substances, alcohol consumption, weed. Why my weed smokers at in here? You, you just smoking and don't even know why you're smoking. Just got to have it. You're losing your mind. You're behind on your priorities. Can't stay focused. Any little stress, any little strain. Anytime somebody say something to you, little strain on the job, you got to start smoking. You just got here. You only been in the world 20 years. How in the world are you so stressed out? Can't nobody say nothing to you. Where did this come from? Are you hearing me today? And we don't know how to process what? Our emotions. 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 Emotions are real, but they're not always right. Feelings are real, but they're not always right. Your emotions have no intellect. Did you hear what I just said? They're real, but you can't make decisions off emotions. Try saying everything you feel and see how many relationships are strained. Look at somebody to the right or to the left. Turn. I feel like telling you something right now. But I can't do it. <laughs> it's just an example. Some of y'all so deep. I ain't say that. I'm crazy. Self. You. <laughs> Emotions. L let me go quick, quickly. Now, when... When we don't know how to process our human weakness or we pretend we don't have it, things get worse. And whatever you can't talk about is out of control in your life. Whatever you can't talk about is controlling you. But watch this. God says, I'm going to take ownership in this. I actually created your need for fulfillment. And so when you experience emotional pain, God says, I'm part owner in how you respond. When there's emotional pain, we develop these proclivities, these tendencies. Yeah. I call them artificial substitutes. There's always somebody in your circle willing to offer you an artificial substitute to cope with your emotional pain. This is why you got to be careful and guard your heart when God is maturing you through emotional pain. Sometimes we end up laying our head in the wrong lap, processing emotional pain. Some of us go so far as we change our whole line of work. We were dating men, now we dating women. Hello, somebody. Processing emotional pain. Hello. Huh. You're trying to figure out where this come from. Some undealt with emotional trauma. Yeah. Artificial substitutes. Watch this. And we start practicing them even when we know they're dangerous for our existence. People will start warning you. You shouldn't do that. Don't put that on social media. Somebody's going to see that. You might get fired doing that. We start playing Russian roulette, like don't care. Yeah, start living with these artificial substitutes and then make our life open for public consumption. It's like being emotionally traumatized. Somebody tell you maybe, mm, you gaining weight. Now, this is going to be a little absurd, but just bear with me. I don't see that. And then all of a sudden, you process that by going by your dress two sizes too small. Get in it and want to go out for public consumption and your crazy friend tell you, girl, you fine. Go, girl. Go on, girl. And, 
then somebody else see you trying to figure out who lied to you? Do you have any friends in your life to tell you the truth? Now, y'all know I'm telling the truth. Anybody been there and now fast forward, look back and say, what was I thinking about? Huh. Or maybe you, you had some standards, but the last relationship, you didn't process the emotional pain right. And you thought maybe you were too good to go through some pain. Lord, why me? And so now you played the victim role. Now you dating somebody and you shame of them. You dating them in secret. Ooh, I'm in somebody's business up in here because it got quiet. <laughs> They just a substitute. Y'all date, uh-uh, ain't nothing like that. We just friends. Y'all dating after dark, you know, it got to be real dark. And <laughs> we go out of town to go out to eat. Y'all over up in New Road somewhere. Tell me, what? Why y'all going way down here? Tell me, my favorite restaurant out there. <laughs> Yeah, baby, if he taking you to St. Francis Bill to eat every time, you got to write in that long drive to think something might not be right. Something. Let me stop. Substitutes. We actually practice them when we know they're dangerous to our existence. When you see somebody doing something and they always got to, I know, see that I know is God. What they're telling you is, I need another fulfillment, and I'm going to help you. Here's the answer real quick. The foundation of all emotional stability and tranquility upon which positive relationships are built and maintained is peace. You got it? What did I say? It's peace. The foundation of emotional stability and tranquility upon which all relationships are built and maintained is peace. The foundation upon which all relationships are built and maintained is what? Peace. 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 When I know and walk in my purpose, I am immediately fulfilled. So I got to start with God, all right? When I know and walk in my purpose, I am immediately, what? Fulfilled. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you're doing that thing God called you to do, you have peace with your God. It's like intimacy. So you and God are like there, but you got to go home where you and the wife, the kid, the dog might not be there. Or you might be doing your thing at church, but you got to go to work on Monday. And you and the boss and you and that work life experience, there is no. You got it? So those relationships are strained, but you and God, y'all got it going on. Purpose starts with God. And when you maximize that moment, you and God, the other relationships gradually begin to get the overflow of your relationship with God. The peace that God wants to give you ain't going to come from money, ain't going to come from your wife, ain't going to come from your husband, not going to come from your children. It has to come from you walking in purpose. This is why Colossians 3 and 15 says, and let the peace of God rule in your heart. Not just live, let it rule. Rule what? Rule every other relationship. Peace. Then when I got this peace, then what? All of my relationships are sustainable because I got peace. This is why sometimes when you're dating somebody, you're like afraid to go to that next stage when you don't see them with peace. This is why you got sometimes date long enough before you make the commitment to see how they respond to crisis, to disappointment, to frustration. Hello, somebody. Are you with me? You riding in the car with somebody, you dating, 
And somebody pulled them over. They say, you know, they reaching in their glove compartment. Somebody said, ooh, wait a minute. They talking about pray for me. No, we need a little bit more than prayer. We need trauma training. We need counseling. You need help. Hello, somebody. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That, that's real. That's real. Because if you don't address it, you think sex will fix it. You would think money will fix it. You would think a drink will fix it. I just need a drink. Well, let me hear him get you a drink. Both of y'all crazy. A drink ain't going to fix that. I done tried that. Come talk to me. I done tried all of it. Ever clear. Barely chase it with some. Ever clear. Somebody ought to shout, hey, man, hey, pastor, you sure enough saved. Young folks, you don't ever want to find out what I'm talking about, all right? Peace. Let me close with this. Walking in purpose is what we call spiritual excellence. This is why you don't wait till you get all your home life and everything in, 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 in order and then come serve God. No, don't put the cart before the horse. You find your purpose in God first and find that peace with God. And then that peace begins to guard all other relationships. It begins to qualify you for everything else that belongs in your life. Like we try to come to God all put together. Like everything in order, then I'm going to serve God. That ain't how you serve God. You don't serve God from your talents alone, from your giftings, from your experience. Like you're going to come help God's house out. I've seen some of those talented, brilliant people get slaughtered when they start doing church work. Because they get exposed. You come in gifted and talented, hello somebody, experienced, and church folks got a way of putting you in your place. And, and, and now sat down at the right hand of God the Father till his enemies be made his footstool. You got to get your relationship with God right. Thank you, Jesus. Hello, somebody. Yes, this peace. The Bible says in James 3 and 18 that the peace or the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. You must find peace with God. This peace in the Greek is a tranquil state of the soul. It is a soul that lives in the assurance of its salvation. Salvation is progressive. It's experiential. Don't just have positional salvation, meaning I know my name is written on the Lamb Book of Life. I know I'm saying you need experiential salvation. You need a salvation you can experience. Hello, somebody, where you see God at work in your life. You know God going to fix it. I don't care how bad the marriage is. I don't care how bad the child is acting up. I don't care how wayward it is. I got peace with God. Why? Because I'm walking in my purpose. And that peace going to rule my heart. Are you hearing me today? And that peace going to cause me to what? Sow in righteousness. Are you hearing me today? The fruit of righteousness. Because watch this. When you're not at peace with God, when your relationships are not governed by peace, when others are the reason for my negative emotional state, child can provoke you, set you off. The job can provoke you, set you off. When other people are the reason for my negative emotional state, guess what? I have become a puppet with somebody else holding the string. Who wants to be a puppet? 
This is why the Bible says, guard your heart. For out of it proceeded the what? Issues of life. I need to be walking in my purpose and have peace with God. If not, other people will be in control of my life. This is how sometimes some of us spend a whole lifetime running from situations, running from negative experiences. Hello, somebody. Running from trouble on the job, not knowing the trouble is sent to promote you. Running from opposition. Hello, somebody. Why? Because we haven't processed past trauma, which now disqualifies us from the next season of our lives. Say with me, peace. So whenever I recognize, and let's say this word of God has found you, and you know God speaking to you in some way, I'm going to give you five power words that helps to bring you back into alignment and out of that place of unrest and confusion. Okay, because sometimes we'll try to use the altar and the altar experience and some good soft music uh, to come back into alignment with God. But Paul says in Romans 7, it's with the mind that we serve the Lord. And can I tell you how the mind works? The mind needs words. The mind needs words. Man shall not live. By bread alone, but by every, I'm listening, by every that proceeded out of the mouth of the mind needs words. This is why they tell you when you don't read, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. You're not adding to your mind proper, proper word. Here's the first word, destiny. Destiny. That's going to bring you right back out of that emotional state. It's going to help you get you back. Because sometimes when we emotionally disturb and there's a deficit, we be acting out. We know what we're doing. This substitute, this fulfillment substitute is detrimental to our existence. But we didn't take out, took our mind off what? Destiny. Destiny. Sometimes people just need to be asked, do you know you're on your way to hell? I never thought about it. Yeah. Words. Destiny. What's your destiny? The secret of your future is hidden in your daily routine. Yeah. Destiny. Second power word is purpose. The reason for my existence. The thing I do that's on course with my life. Purpose. Purpose was established in Adam, but it's fulfilled in Jesus. Did you hear what I just said? It's established in Adam. That's why you find it in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Worship God in the earth. Represent God in the earth. Take care of God things. Expression of God's lordship. Reproduce, replenish. Destiny. Purpose. The third one is vision. A specific event that actually determines the magnitude of what I do on course with my life. Events that determine the magnitude of what I do. God will give you a vision to increase the magnitude of your life. Did you hear what I just said? And so you can't let emotional distance or somebody else's trying to produce a negative experience in your life get you out of alignment with your vision. Are you with me? Sometimes we got to remind, what are you doing? How are you just doing nothing in this season? You, have you gotten disconnected from your vision? Do you have a vision? You need vision. Helen Keller would say, what's worse than being blind? She says to have eyes and have no vision. I would rather be blind with vision, she says, than to have eyes and no vision. Why? Because to have eyes and no vision will develop an incredible deficit in my life and somebody else will be pulling the strings. Here's the fourth word, vocation. This is the avenue of choice that I make to give expression of the talents and gifts that I have. My vocation. 
You ever seen somebody doing some work and you know they can do so much more? It's like you got so much more talent. Why are you only doing that? Or why don't you, why you make a choice and do that? Add to your life this. Add to your vocation that. Vocation. And typically when we start living beneath our privilege, some emotional deficit has occurred that we didn't process right. Some trauma happened on a past job. Fight with my mama. Fight with my daddy. Bad relationship. Bad breakup. Betrayal. I didn't go get counsel. Didn't submit to the feet of Jesus and let him heal my heart. And now I'm living beneath my privilege. Going to every new training, every marketplace leadership institute, every conference, and never can get my life on alignment. That's the booger bear of emotional trauma. I don't care how much knowledge you add to your head. Until you deal with the matter in your heart, all your notes and all of your head knowledge won't be the compass for your life. It is the heart. Are you hearing me today? Yeah. It's the heart. Vision. Vocation. Uh, watch this. Vocation actually overlaps destiny. And the fifth word is plan. Ask somebody, what's your plan? Got you thinking now, huh? Plan. This is the systematic scheduling of events to bring the vision to manifestation. Plan. Systematically scheduling events. Hey, blessed Savior. To bring the vision. To pa don't act like you got a plan and you don't have vision. If you do have a plan, that's just some more arbitrarily planned so you can have the right answer when somebody asks you about something. But you really hadn't seen vision from God. And without that, without that counsel, are you with me? All plans will fail. Now remember, God has given every believer permission to overcome any trauma. Tell somebody you've been given permission. When you walk in purpose, when you bring that life of yours in Christ Jesus... And say, I am now a believer in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he now gives you permission to overcome it. That means he ain't going to stop it from happening. But I will empower you to overcome it. Some stuff going to happen to you in life just because you live here. It's just like stuff come to your mailbox. It don't have your name on it. It just have residence. Lord have mercy. Life going to bring some stuff to your mailbox just because you live down here. No use of saying, why me? Why not you? You can't stop everything from coming into your life. But you can have this assurance. God has given me permission to overcome it. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that we have in him. Even our what? Our faith. He's given me permission to overcome. And here's why you got to keep moving. Here's why you got to go back to these power words, destiny, purpose, vision, vocation, and plan. It's because the anecdote, the anecdote to your past is your future. That means if you don't like nothing about your past, pursue your future. Well, I'm trying to pursue my future, but... I've been traumatized so much. Find the peace of God and find peace in purpose. This is why the first place you run to when you know you got emotional deficits and you out of control is to the Lord. It's to the church. Because you need peace. If not, you're just going to get substitute fulfillments. Everybody going to tell you how to cope. I know some folks been going to counseling for 20 years. Still on the couch. They'll become addicted to just talking. No deliverance. You shall know the truth, and the truth going to make you. You spending thousands of dollars on counseling. They done describe you as schizophrenic, psychosis, whatever else. Mentally, ask your neighbor what you got. Whatever it is. And then you start accepting these labels. The devil is alive. He's alive. 
Hey, you got too much life to live. Are you hearing me today? The antidote to my past is what? My future. That's why these words are so important. And then lastly, God says to tell you, reposition yourself for the blessing. I made promises over your life. You're not just to exist according to your predicament. I want you to live according to purpose. I've attached promises to your life. As a matter of fact, God has already, he's already provided. He's already made plans and he's already fulfilled those plans. You've just got to come into the manifestation of it. And here's the ultimate revenge. I'm finished. The ultimate revenge that God has on his adversary, Lucifer, Satan, the archangel that took a third out of heaven with him. The battle is not between you and the devil. The, that battle was between God and the archangel. God defeated him. Hello, somebody. I said God defeated him. Your job is just to keep him under your feet. You were created and produced down here in the earth, but God had already threw Lucifer, the archangel here, when you got here. Satan was already here when you got here. He is not your fight. Hello, somebody. He's God's fight. And the Bible says, for this reason was the Son of God manifested that the works of the devil might be destroyed. And so God says, you don't have a Satan problem. You got a flesh problem. I can teach you how to manage your flesh. Hey, are you with me? Yeah, if I can teach you how to crucify your flesh. If I can teach you how to walk according to the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of your. That means you won't do everything you feel like doing. Leaders know what I'm talking about. You can't say everything you want to say. In business, when you're managing a big P&L, their teacher, are you with me? Civil treatment for managers. Yeah, uh, people are going to always try to provoke you and get you out of character. And uh, two things you can't take back is time and a spoken word. So when somebody sends you something crazy and you tempted to respond, type the email, hit save as a draft, get up and walk away, come back in five minutes and read it again. Because if you say the wrong thing, you just put this whole corporation, its whole market cap in exposure and in liability. Hello, somebody. Yeah. Feelings are real. They're not always right. And so you have to learn emotional intelligence. And you learn it through the Spirit. Are you hearing me today? The ultimate revenge is that everything the devil tries against you, God designed it only to make you stronger, bigger, and better. That's what you got to tell yourself so your emotions don't get the best of you. And we know all things going to work together. You're dealing with trauma now. You've stumbled. The anecdote to the past, don't stay there, is your future. Get up. I don't care who don't want to go with you. You get up. I don't, who care, I don't care who says I can't trust you ever again. You get up. Whatever the devil tries, God says, it will only make you bigger, better, and stronger. Yeah. See yourself. Don't hide from it any longer. See yourself. Bigger. Better. Stronger. If you're ready, I want you to stand to your feet. I want as many of you that need to come to the altar, need to make your way here quickly and give God permission to deal with the pain, the trauma, the disappointment. Because this absence of peace is causing you to aggressively make other relationships miserable. Sometimes it's the relationship with yourself. God, I need peace. I got to move past this.
find yourself keep recycling past situations, past trauma, keep bringing it up. Joseph said, in naming his son Manasseh, God calls me to forget it. For some of you, that's the grace you receive on this altar. He calls me to forget. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Some of you need to get the string back. You've given that string to other people. You're like a puppet. Perhaps your emotions have gotten the best of you in this season. You can go from zero to ten. With certain people's words, you've given them authorization to shut you down. When did their words become more important than your words? Who gave them that authority? God says, get your authority back. Other people's opinion of you shouldn't matter more than your opinion of yourself. The purpose God called you to. Huh? Your birth is evident that your purpose is necessary. You wouldn't be here if you didn't matter to God. And because you matter to God, he has already decided who belongs in your life and who doesn't. So it doesn't matter who rejected you. God got somebody tailor-made for you. So you're not to consider your predicament. You're not to consider your circumstance. Because the peace of God is relational. It's not circumstantial. You're not going to have more peace when you become taller, thinner, skinnier, wealthier. Whatever you feel like the deficit exists. That de deficit only exists emotionally. It's not even real. You are more than enough. Hey, God makes no mistakes. You are everything he wants you to be, hey, to fulfill the assignment he's called you to. And all of your imperfections, he knows who you are and has still made a choice to deal with you, to work through you. Father, we surrender. Every pain, every hurt, every emotional deficit, every insecurity, every fear, everything that's attached itself to our soul, every gender restriction, every gender instinct, every proclivity, everything that was introduced in our progeny by our forefathers, we surrender it to you. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. See him taking it. Hey, thank you. I speak a grace of God come upon your life right now where you sense it in your soul. Release it by faith. You can feel this. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Uh, faith faith surrender it you can't go back with it you can't go back with an insecure mind can't go back with them destructive emotions can't go back trying harder no this is over I eulogize this dysfunction hallelujah I renounce this spirit of fear hey thank you Jesus God I let it go Father hands that are open to you hands that are raised instead of stretch consider our human depravity and pity us hey. hey yes Lord cleanse us from all unrighteousness Father we've sown to ourselves inappropriately we've made some declarations and vows that were not led and uttered by a spirit of faith but a spirit of fear we renounce it we pluck up every unrighteous seed that we've sown even to our own hearts we renounce the voices that have tried to control us. Every witchcraft spirit, every manipulating spirit. Some of us had manipulating parents that tried to control us. We were born into witchcraft and sorcery, but we renounce it now. We will not be demonized and belittled any longer. We will not be controlled by others' opinions over us. Every negative word that's trying to prosper in our life, we renounce it now. It's under the curse. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And you've given us permission to overcome by grace. We receive grace and more grace. Come on, lift your hands high. Receive it by faith. And the Holy Spirit comes upon you even now. Uh, hey, blessed Savior. Open your heart. I said receive the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of wisdom, spirit of knowledge. Hey, thank you, God. Spirit of peace. He abides in you to minister to you. Minister to that place of vulnerability. Minister to my pain. Hey, yes, God. My scars cause me to forget the pain and discover the purpose behind it. I will be empowered by every, every trouble. I'm made bigger, stronger. I'm made better by it. 
I will tell my testimony. I will walk in victory. Yes, Lord. Hey, I will walk in victory. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph. I receive my victory today. Yes, God. Hey, I receive it. I share my grace with you. I receive it. Hey, he's healing the mind. Open it. Hey, he's healing the mind. Hey, open it. Hey, yes, God. Yes, God. Come on. You got to open your heart. Yes. to walk in the season of wisdom that you never knew you could. I speak wisdom come upon you. Prudence and discretion. God's getting ready to word your mouth. You're getting ready to speak to your storms and past trauma like you've never spoken to it before. You will not be deceived and seduced any longer. You're going to recognize every contrary spirit, every conniving, cunning spirit that's trying to seduce you out of God's best for your life. You're walking in purpose and you're now qualifying for something better. I speak better over your life. Oh, yeah. It's happening. Hey. It's happening. Thank you. It's happening. Hallelujah. It's happening. Exalted thoughts. Thank you, Jesus. Hey. Let him take your garment of heaviness. Let him take it. Your garment of heaviness. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Joy be birth. Joy. Lord, I can find joy out of all of my scars. Joy. I didn't let the devil kill you. Joy. You didn't suffocate in your misery. Joy. He wanted to destroy you, but I kept you. Joy. That scar will not be unto death. Joy! If you're sick in your body, be healed right now. Every infirmity, every disease the devil tried to lay on you, I speak you are healed now in Jesus' name. I feel the Lord healing somebody. Thank you. Hey, hey, glory to God. You didn't know he was going to do it this quick. You ain't going to need medicine. God heals you now. Stress and anxiety has introduced vulnerabilities and disease. God heals you now. Strengthen your immune system. At the same time, he's strengthening your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And because God is the greatest power, give allegiance to him. We shall never, never be defeated. One more minute. 60 seconds. Make every one of them count. Because God I want the devil to know it's the greatest hey. Tonight you may have to go home and lay hands on yourself. Hey, whatever you're troubling, trouble by because now peace be upon your life. Shalom. You're gonna be alone, but you won't be lonely no more. We shall never. I pray God makes the enemy forget your number. Take away every memory of what seemed to be pleasurable. But it was to my own detriment. No, no, no. We shall never, we shall never, we shall never. No man's going to control you any longer. No woman's going to control you. Be defeated. Every witch spirit, every manipulating spirit. And because God, that troubling, agitating spirit on the job. You're going with peace tomorrow, and promotion is in your near future. We shall never. God's going to make your, even your enemies be your footstool. Hey, hallelujah. He's going to use what was meant for evil to promote you. Because God, because God, because God. I'm a living witness. He took every negative word that men spoke over me and caused it to work for my promotion. And when I retired, I was leading the charge in the U.S., Behind every negative, every negative season, he made it work and because God. No, 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 no. He's stronger than your mama, stronger than your daddy's word. We shall never. 
You ain't a victim any longer. You're a victor. Hey, hey, hey. God, I thank you. I thank you. I didn't matter much to somebody else, but I matter to you. Come on into worship with me. It's the greatest power. Come on. I need some worshipers in this room. Come on. I need you who are in the audience. Help me worship God with my brothers and sisters. I sense another level. I sense another level in God. Come on, shout hallelujah. I give you praise, God. I got to let you go. Thank you, God. Walk softly before God. The next 72 hours, I'm going to challenge all of you. Next 72 hours, be sensitive. God's going to pull back on some of your desires for certain environments. It's okay. Think it not strange. Just get quiet. I'm going to teach you how to train your ear to hear God's voice. What decides a season from another season is the word from God. You need to hear his voice. When God speaks, it becomes a major event. When God speaks to you, revelation is permission. He will reveal something to you within 72 hours and it will be permission. And once God gives you permission, you don't need man's permission. Once God reveals to you what's next, you don't need permission from man to do it. You ready to walk by faith? Give God some praise if you believe it. You're going higher, deeper, more inspired. And you're going to change the world. Yes! And he Go back to your seat, Oscar. Hallelujah. Grab your communion element. We shall never, we shall never, we shall never. Thank you, God. Come on, God, I thank you, God, I give you praise and be called Because God is the greatest power. I give you praise, I give you praise. We shall never be defeated. No, 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 no. And because God is the greatest power. of our church are open. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Ellis, I believe God's leading me to be a part of this church. I would love to be your pastor if that's you. I can't think of a better place than right here. Come on, my team is waiting on you. Hallelujah. I think we had a couple of families who joined at the 8 o'clock service. This is an incredible place at the right time to be connected to what God is at work doing. They'll be here even after service if you so desire. Raise your hand if you don't have a communion element. I want to make sure you get it. Thank you, God. Yes. There's still time. I say there's still time. Come on over on the Lord's side. If you're here today and you're not saved, transfer your trust alone in Jesus Christ alone for the remission of your sins and the gift of eternal life. You can simply tell him, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need saving. I believe you sent Jesus to down the cross for my sins. Raise him on the third day. Therefore, I transfer my trust alone in Jesus Christ alone for the remission of my sins and the gift of eternal life. Therefore, I confess I am saved. If you did that, salvation has come to your house, uh, to your heart. Tell him, fill me with your spirit, God, so I can live a life pleasing unto you. Somebody's watching me online. Salvation is happening right there in your house, right there in your car. I pray that you will begin to praise him and thank him. And then let us hear from you. Glory to God. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. We got one? All right. Come on, show your love for this daughter. I'm going to try to be the best pastor I can be to you. Thank you for trusting me. We'll get you right after this act of worship. Get ready for miracles and something incredible to happen as we begin to celebrate and salute the table in which God has prepared. Hallelujah. Four observations. Glory to God. That my brothers and sisters, or now only my brothers here, are going to be sharing today. The Lord's Supper, or what we would call Holy Communion, is a fellowship meal. It took place at a table. It's God fellowshipping with his family. The Bride of Hebrews says it's a better covenant than the first one. And so we must give deference and honor to this table by a sacred observation considering all that God has for us at the table. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. 
I want you to prepare your hearts. I believe doing Holy Communion, if you are sick in your body, this act of faith causes you to grab hold to the promise that Isaiah's writing of he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. I want you to claim it today. Hallelujah. I want God to heal somebody. Come on, right now. You hadn't even taken them yet. You're releasing your faith. Asthma, back trouble, eye trouble. Hallelujah. Mental dysfunction, mental cognitive dissonance, diabetes, hypertension. Nothing is too hard for God. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Supper begins with a backward look. Yes. Do this in remembrance of me. In AD 53, approximately 30 years after the crucifixion, Paul wrote our earliest account of the institution of the Lord's Supper. It was already being handed down as an oral tradition in the churches. We note the formula of the loaf and cup in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25. Jesus took bread saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. The master took the cup from the Passover table saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Yes. Just as the old covenant was sealed with blood, and a meal eaten before the Lord, so the new covenant is recalled by a memorial meal. For Christ, our Pascal lamb, has been sacrificed. The Lord's Supper calls us to look at the cross. Blessed be the God of our salvation. death till he comes. The observation has a future reference. It is eschatological. We look forward to Christ's return in glory. Hallelujah. And our fourth observation. In our worship at the Lord's table, yes. we take an outward look. 1 Corinthians 11, 26. You proclaim the Lord's death. The communion meal is an act at word. By participating in it, we herald and announce our faith. We look forward from the worship services in the world's need. People are lost, hungry, weary, and in pain. The observance is a call to Christian service. The Lord's Supper calls us to remember and proclaim Christ's sacrificial death. 
It invites us to celebrate his living presence in our midst. It fixes our hope on the final victory to realize at his coming. Blessed be the name of the Lord. instituted such an ordinance that we practice some 2,000 years later that he took bread and after breaking it and giving thanks he held it and says take and eat this is my body broken for you hallelujah the Bible says when they had finished eating then he took a cup and held it up and says this is the New Testament my blood which is shed for you take and drink hallelujah thank you Jesus if you know you're saved without any doubt in your mind I want you to make some noise for God with a great hallelujah come on let's shout hallelujah come on God I thank you come on you can keep it going keep it going if you know you're saved, why don't you stand to your feet and give him some praise? If you accept the challenge from the table, we'll call to the world. We'll call to Christian service. We'll call to be the light of the world. Go be better. Hallelujah. Go let your light shine. Testify to the faithfulness of God. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. From day to day a challenge. I want you to witness to at least three people on this week coming up. Three people, just a minimum of three. And there are some people you have never shared your faith. And it could go something as simple as, did I ever tell you how I came to faith in Jesus Christ? It's no different than saying, did I ever tell you about this great restaurant I went to? Think about your story. What caused you to place faith in Jesus Christ and what it means to you? Share your faith. Share your witness. Maybe something great God did in your life. Go tell somebody that I put my faith in God and God turned my relationship around, gave me a promotion. You heard the testimony from Dr. Jameson Austin. I tried three times, but I didn't give up. Some of you have bounced back from so much. Share your testimony. Can we do that? Absolutely. Give God another praise. I want everybody now, as we get ready to go, I want you to get an offering in your hand. Quickly, I want every member, make sure you are honoring God. I want every member to be in covenant with this church. Be a tither. Trust God with your increase. Watch him. Watch him cause you to live on the open window from heaven. Hallelujah. Miracles are getting ready to take place in the financial arena. I want you to not miss God in this season. Hallelujah. UCFM, I need you in this season to be prayerful. God is leading us to greater heights and deeper depths. And uh, I'm believing for some acquisition concerning our school and wellness center and a new facility we've been looking at. I need you praying and believing God that God's going to give us Florida Boulevard in some way. Hello, somebody. Uh, something is coming, something is brewing, and God can do anything but fail concerning his people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for gifts to give, hearts to give from. Our worship is sacred to us, and how can we worship without a sacrifice? Surely we've sacrificed our time and attention, but now we sacrifice our treasure. We present not only our treasure, but our bodies to you 
as a living sacrifice. Now, God, the way we give it, I would love for you to give it back the same way. I pray that it's back to a thousandfold return. That as the believer releases from their heart, some don't need money. They need an open door. They need a contract. They need a miracle in their body. I pray today that this seed serves as a conduit for their faith. Let your glory be revealed. And this is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. If you're in agreement, shout amen. All right, if you want to obey the ushers, if you're using the envelope system, come from the back, place it in the basket. You'll use a debit card or credit card. You can swipe it to the right or to the left. Bring my phone, I'm going to give again. You can text to give. Use a debit card or credit card. All first time guests, we got a reception for you right next door. I would love to shake your hand, answer any questions you have, and we got some refreshments for you as well. Monday Night Momentum Men, I believe it's September the 16th. Yep, September the 16th, Monday night, 6.30. I would love to see every man in this church meet me here with, along with other men. We got great food, fellowship, it's free. You're going to be really impacted and empowered by what our team has put together. And it's a moment you don't want to miss. September is the month of worship, I'm told. Y'all going forth still? All right, come on, give it up for the wonderful music team of UCFM. September 18th, men, not the 16th, September the 18th, that's a Monday night, third Monday night in September, hallelujah. Also, September is an incredible month, why my September birthday's at again? All right, I love it, I got two children, my son Mark and Markayla, today is Markayla's birthday, my oldest, happy birthday Markayla, wherever you are, praise God for the gift of life. Incredible, incredible potential in our children. Let's keep praying for all of our children. Can we do that? You pray for my children, I'm going to pray for yours, and God's going to see us through. Amen. Stand to your feet. i got to let you go. Look at somebody to the right or to the left and tell them, neighbor, if by chance somebody failed to tell you that they love you today, let me be the first to tell you, I love you, and a thing you can do about it. God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you.